This is New Cap News. A local woman wants to change Lloyd Minster's bylaw on what pets are allowed in the city. She says her micro pig was deemed livestock by the authorities, forcing her to keep it at a friend's property outside of town. Gina Martin has more on why this woman wants the bylaw to change, not only for her, but for the other pig parents in the city. He's spoiled, <laughs> rotten, and he's very house trained and gets along with anyone. There was a time when Arnold the pig roamed this room and greeted guests on a daily basis. But one summer's day last year, everything changed. Someone called in and said there was a pig in Lloydminster. And they came down and they basically told me that a pig is a pig. They, being bylaw officers, who told her Arnold was not considered a pet. She was first given a warning, then a ticket a month later after Arnold was spotted again. It was then she decided it would be better to keep him outside of the city for the time being. Micro pig is not livestock, it's actually a pet. It was bred down to be, be a pet, not, it's not for meat. According to bylaw 17 2015, a pig is considered as livestock, which nobody is allowed to keep in town, except if part of certain organizations or approved to do so by the city manager. The bylaw also categorizes other animals like sheep, goats, and chickens as livestock as well. The Waltons will be fighting their ticket in court on Wednesday, where they hope the judge will understand where they're coming from when it comes to Arnold the pig. But the fight might not end there, as they've already started a petition with close to 500 signatures on it. The petition basically just is uh, right now is a feeler to see if I have support with Lloyd Minster um, to actually change the bylaw. Support Walton believes she has, claiming she isn't the only one with a micro pig in the border city. Getting her ticket dismissed is just the first step, with the next one possibly starting an official petition so tickets like this one aren't given in the future. Gina Martin, New Cap News. Well, mental health was the focus at a conference and wellness fair in Vermilion. As Angie Mellon explains, guest speakers and vendors worked to open up the dialogue. It was a packed house at the Vermilion Regional Center where the topic of mental health was being discussed. One of the three speakers, Alan Keeler, who personally struggled with mental illness and addiction, is using today's events to empower others. I mean, we all have emotions, we all struggle, and there still continues to be some stigma around these sense of issues, and so as soon as you get people together who speak a common language, you can't help but uh, shed light on these issues and potentially heal. 175 people were in attendance today, which is bigger than organizers anticipated. We're so happy that everyone came out to learn about the health and wellness that they might need at home. The economy was a major factor in deciding to hold the conference. We decided to hold this event because of the downturn in the economy and we just want to be able to help people and, and give people the tools that they can use for themselves or to help others. Both Yonkman and Keeler hope for common outcomes from the conference and wellness fair. The stigma is so strong that you don't want to ask for mental health help, but we hope that people learn how to ask for help and that it's okay to ask for help. The takeaway, I think it's going to be different for everyone, but at the end of it is to ask for what you need uh, when you're struggling. Participants were encouraged to talk to each other, visit vendors, and color throughout the day. The plans for next year are already underway. We already looked into speakers for next year and we just hope everyone will return and we'll keep connected with the ones that came this year. The conversation on mental health doesn't stop today. Tomorrow kicks off Mental Health Awareness Month and the Lloyd Minster Region Health Foundation has a special announcement. For Newcap News, I'm Angie Mellon. Well, we have two puppies and a cat for adoption in this week's pet project. Cinnamon and Ginger Snap are both four-month-old pups, while Ladybug is a two-year-old domestic short-haired cat. Here's John from the SPCA. This lovable pair of four-month-old pups are Cinnamon and Ginger Snap. They arrived in the shelter back on December 14th as a strays. When they arrived, they both had mange, which results in considerable hair loss. It took over a month for the hair to start to grow back, but now both have been spayed and are waiting to meet their new families. Cinnamon, the bigger of the two, is one sweet pup who is very observant. She will watch you at first before she decides to play. Once you get her going though, Cinnamon is just full of energy. Ginger Snap, on the other hand, is always full of energy. This is one enthusiastic young lady. She just loves to play and absolutely loves to meet new people. Both of these girls will make a welcome addition to any family. So stop by the SPCA and meet this wonderful pair today. 
This beautiful feline is Ladybug, a two-year-old domestic short-haired cat. Ladybug was brought to us as a stray along with her litter of kittens back in October. Her kittens have all been adopted and now it's Ladybug's turn. Ladybug is a very quiet but loving cat who absolutely adores people. The minute that she sees you, her ears perk up and she's rubbing at the kennel door waiting for you to take her out. Ladybug's idea of a perfect day is relaxing, staring out the window and soaking up the sun. In between cat naps, she loves to curl up next to you and get some one-on-one -on -one attention. Ladybug is truly a wonderful cat that is so full of love. Once you meet her, you won't want to leave without her. So what are you waiting for? Come down to the SPCA and meet Ladybug today. And back at home, Lloydminster RCMP have laid charges against a 27-year-old man after an alleged shooting at Amigos early Sunday morning. Chantal Germo with the latest. A scary night for party goers in Lloydminster this weekend at Amigos nightclub. At about 2.30 early Sunday morning, Lloydminster RCMP were called to the bar after reports of a shooting. Police dog services were called on scene and were able to recover a stolen firearm. Though no one was injured in the incident, RCMP did manage to apprehend a male suspect with the help of witnesses. Now 27-year-old Guled Mohammed of Edmonton faces several charges including careless use of a firearm, possession of a prohibited weapon, and the possession of controlled substance. The reason for the shooting is yet to be confirmed, however, Mohammed appeared before an Alberta Justice of Peace and will remain in custody until he is set to appear in provincial court on February 7, 2017. Reporting from RCMP Detachment, Chantal Germo, Newcap News. And Lloydminster City Council has finally approved a budget for 2017. After facing a $10.5 million deficit, the final budget is balanced after many cuts were made. Adam McVicker has more. After three months, four drafts and deliberations involving two separate councils, Lloydminster City Council has approved a balanced 2017 budget. Administration really went back uh, through each team, each department, uh, with a fine tooth comb and, and really looked for efficiencies. The $78 million budget includes an expected municipal tax increase of 4%, generating over $23 million from property taxes to maintain essential services. As people will say, you campaigned for a zero tax increase. I certainly did. But as you can appreciate, and I think they can appreciate, if you get to your bank account and there's, no, there's the balance is zero, you have to do what you have to do to keep the, the business open. The budget also features a stormwater user fee expected to generate $2 million. It's going to be additional revenue for the city to pay for some serious capital infrastructure projects that need to be done down the road. The city hoping the fund replenishes the municipal reserve. No new borrowing and at the end of the year we're going to have a little bit in the piggy bank to be able to start picking away at these major infrastructure projects that really we need to start addressing now. And One of those projects, the wastewater treatment plant. Why is it in the shape it's in? It was built 30 years ago. Things deteriorate. They need to be replaced. Budget deliberations have been complicated this year with the introduction of a rookie council and mayor halfway through the process. Coming on board with the budget already starting is, is feeling like you're trying to catch up to a moving vehicle and, and, uh, and sometimes you feel like you caught up to it and other times you found you lost ground but I, I think we caught up to it today. And now many of the city's departments will be taking major cuts. This year's budget includes department-by-department department financial reports as well. Those documents and the entire budget can be found on the city's website. As for a mill rate, that will be set later in the spring. Reporting from City Hall, Adam McVicker, Newcap News. And local construction business owners and contractors are more informed about how they are affected by the Alberta carbon tax, as well as options for rebates following a presentation at the Lloydminster Construction Association helped kind of get rid of some maybe some misconceptions we had. Blaine Steffen adds his business is already making changes in response to the additional tax. No We're going to be encouraging our customers to, to maybe spend less time uh, fixing older pieces of equipment because all of a sudden it's going to make more sense to upgrade that. Presenter Brent Gossner says businesses will likely need to make other changes such as what projects they bid on how far for a job you're going to drive and things like that. You're going to, you're going to take steps to be able to uh, potentially reduce your carbon footprint. Gossner also encourages business owners to take advantage of the available carbon rebates. This is Newcap Sports. 
Well, it was an evening of entertainment for female hockey fans Friday night as the Lloydminster Bobcats hosted their annual ladies night. Drew Miller has more in this week's Beyond the Boards. The Civic Centre was rocking on Friday night, but not for the regular reason, as the Bobcat organization went back in time. This is the 13th annual Bobcats Ladies Night. It's 80s theme because we're celebrating our 35th season this year, and we figure why not do a flashback. This fundraiser is one of the biggest of the year for the Bobcats, and ladies in the community went all out dressing up in their best 80s themed outfits. I mean, the 80s theme's awesome. You see everything from... Uh, Madonna to Titan Bright, uh, everyone's having a great time and the dueling pianos know which songs to play, it's perfect. We should have had a little bit of a heads up, I'm sure a lot of the guys wanted to get dressed up too and rock the theme. The players helped out at the event with jobs such as selling raffle tickets and serving drinks, but making sure everyone is having a good time is their number one priority. You can count endlessly the amount of times this community has came in and supported our team and it shows in events like this. The event was a huge success and the Bobcats organization can't thank the community of Lloydminster enough. We've only sold about half of what we did last year but the atmosphere is just incredible like always. Our donations were incredible so I couldn't be more thankful than I am right now. Drew Miller, UCAP Sports. Beyond the Boards is brought to you by City Center Auto Body. In business since 1983 with two locations to serve you better. They can fix anything. And for much of the year, injuries have plagued the Bobcats, but the team received an injection of talent last week when Chasten Braid returned, and just in time for the team to utilize him in a new way. The former Saskatoon Blades forward was sidelined for three games with a sprained MCL. He was thrust right back into his spot on the team's top line with Zach Webb and Rob Johnson, and his return is timely with the team desperately in need of scoring. Yeah, you know, they're our go-to line, right? Uh, Webb, Johnson, Braid, you know, they have some experience and, you know, we got to rely on them. Braid's role changed Wednesday when he was inserted into the team's power play at the point position. As one of the Bobcats' most skilled players, Braid's effect was instantly felt with the unit developing more chances. We've been working on a power play. It didn't show tonight, but in practice it's going with four forwards and a D-man. Well, yeah, the power play, you know, we haven't been getting a lot of goals, so we got to try something different. So he decided to go with that and just need a bit more shots, you know, get it set up a bit more and hopefully get, get more goals. Lloydminster's power play ranks last in the AJHL, operating at just over 8%. Here is new cap weather. You mentioned it earlier in the cast, but it is really nice to see that, that extra sunlight start to linger during the days. Yeah, slowly but surely we're seeing those sunrise or sunset times, I should say, get later and later. And those days become longer. And here's some yeah. trivia for you. Alert, none of it actually way in the north of Canada. They are seeing right now 22 hours of darkness and only two hours of daylight. So it is worse up there than here as far as daylight is concerned. But right now, Midwest minus 17, the Battlefords minus 17, and Lakeland minus 15 right now. Overnight tonight, minus 15 in the Midwest. That will be the temperature for 5 a.m. So warming a couple degrees by that time. Minus 19 in the Battlefords, minus 17 in the Lakeland. Winds out of the Northwest, 15 to 25 in the Midwest, and could see a flurry. Tomorrow, temperatures around the region, minus 12 in the Midwest, minus 11 in the Battlefords and the Lakeland. The Lakeland will see mainly sunny skies. The Battlefords, mix of sun and cloud to mostly cloudy. It's going to be gusty northwest winds, 25 to 30. Midwest, northwest winds, 20 to 25, and could see a flurry. Across our region, tomorrow at about 4 p.m., in case you missed this map from earlier, minus 15 in Isla Cross, minus 16 in Green Lake and Meadow Lake, minus 12 in Provost, minus 12 in Wainwright, minus 12 if you are watching us from Vermilion tonight. Hello to you guys. Minus 9 in Vegreville, minus 10 in Lac La Biche, and minus 9 in Edmonton. So as we look at the seven-day forecast, it's going to get even worse than today. Minus 13 on Thursday, winds out of the west, minus 13 Friday. Start to get a bit of a southeast wind as a warm front starts to push in from the west, but not really warming us up, though. We do get northeast winds by the weekend, bringing in some snow on the other side of the low. 
highs of minus 18 and minus 19. Monday, I think, is our highest chance of some snow, but really Sunday or Monday seems like our highest potential in total. Monday, minus 20, and Tuesday, minus 20 as well.